Hi, my name's Angelo, and welcome to the first and best episode of Player Chat featuring Philip Mays of Mighty Kingdom. How are you going, Phil? Good. Can I call you Phil? Is that okay? You can call me Phil, you can call me anything. Excellent, you great. So, um, let's start off by talking a little bit about, about your work with Mighty Kingdom, and can you, can you even fill us in on what Mighty Kingdom is? Yeah, so sure. So Mighty Kingdom, I started with a, another ex chroman or ex rat bag, sorry, back in 2010, initially looking at making iPhone games or iPhone apps. So, Let's rewind, start that again. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Do you want to start the whole section again? No, no, that's fine. So, uh, yeah, Mighty Kingdom started with myself and a ex-co-worker from Ratbag called Jindo back in 2010. Yep. At that stage, I was working at Chrome and part of you know, one of the, the sort of 30 or 40 people were at the studio at that stage. And I kind of felt that I didn't have a lot of opportunity to pr progress within that organisation. We were very much a one-project studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided to look at something else the iPhone had just came out, apps were the cool thing, and so I decided to jump ship and, and, and try that out. We made a lot of apps for a lot of people, did a lot of things. Uh, one in particular, we spun out to a separate business, took it to the US, raised some money, and it was about that time I realized that making apps wasn't my passion, that's not what I wanted to do with my life. And mm -hmm. so I decided to take Mighty Kingdom from being an app developer and turn it back into a games developer. Yeah. So 2012, we started to make that pivot, and we started to move back into 100% gaming. All our new clients was, were gaming clients from that point on. Mm -hmm. And since then we've grown from about four people when we made that split between the, the apps and the game business and now we're up to 35. And yeah, we've been working with brands such as Shopkins, which is our sort of biggest brand at the moment, mm -hmm. but also in the, we've worked with uh, Disney and, and many other top flight brands. Yeah, I saw that you've also been working with, uh, with Marvel and um, uh, Disney, you mentioned Disney, but uh, there's talks about Warner Brothers as well, is that correct? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we can't announce. No, no, uh, no that's a, lot of the, a lot of these things do come with a very strict confidentiality for agreement. The, for those bigger companies, for sure, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, there is a lot of, we've been speaking to a lot of very big entertainment brands. The opportunity we've been given with the Shopkins license is to show a lot of expertise and leadership in a very particular market yep. around kids gaming, and that sort of got us a lot of attention. And yes, we are getting phone calls from some pretty big partners who yeah, are now yeah. looking out to us for that expertise and they want to... So, so that how does that place. work then? So did they reach out to you in that case? They see the success of Shopkins and stuff and they're just like, oh yeah, let's get these guys. Yeah, so as a service company, I think your best advertisement for your work is, you know, for your services is the work that you produce. Yep. And with Shopkins, we've been producing games there would have been, which have been top 10 in the kids category worldwide. And yes, yeah, so certainly when these brands are looking in that space, to see who they want to partner with, our, our apps are right up there. Mm. And so that's caused them yeah, to directly reach out to us. We, you know, we're in that very fortunate position where we've moved on from being the place that people go to because we're, we're cheaper and because we can, we can do things um, you know, on time, on schedule. And now they're actually, we've shown leadership in this space, so they're actually looking for us for that expertise. And so the conversations are a bit different now. They're, they're not cost conscious decisions, you know, mm. the sort of projects are more about how can we take what you guys have done, how can we apply that to our brands, and how can we sort of differentiate ourselves in the market? Yeah, so it's very cool, a very exciting time at, at Mighty Kingdom. Yeah, well, even just for an Adelaide-based company to be able to get, you know, partnerships with these larger brands and things, you know, it's a pretty significant thing for something in little old Adelaide where the game scene is really quite small and compared to something like Melbourne, it is relatively dire, yeah. you know? But I think Melbourne sucks a lot of attention when it comes to the, the conversation around gaming in Australia, yeah. but I think there's a lot of sneaky good things going on around the country. Yeah, you, yeah. you look in Brisbane, there's some amazing um, you know, companies that are being built over there. You've got, even in Canberra, you're, you're seeing a lot of the old big studios who, you know, where they were around the country, they've, they've disappeared and, and the, the, the players have sort of fragmented out and they're all sort of coming back together and forming these new sort of studios. And so I think a lot of them tend to fly under the radar. I mean, certainly Mighty Kingdom, we haven't been out there sort of beating the drum too loudly. Mm -hmm. We've been much sort of more focused on doing Yep. But I think uh, as we sort of move forward in, in, with Mighty Kingdom, we're looking at sort of taking a bit more of a leadership role there and, and sort of helping, taking the expertise and all the lessons that we've learned and trying to find a way of giving them back to the community. Absolutely. Well, that's fantastic to hear. Um, so well, let's start off with, with the beginning of Mighty Kingdom. Though. So how did that come about? How did, how, did, uh, what's, what's the, how did it go from being something that was so small where, you, as you were saying, focusing on like, you know, apps and things like that, to then making the leap to doing games and then becoming such a huge success? I always find that I don't tend to do things unless I put myself in a position where I can't fail. And so to pivot from being a app developer to a games developer, I decided that we had to release uh, a dozen games 
in, in, a, in a year. Mm -hmm. And so I basically completely re-architected the company around very rapidly building prototypes and getting them to market. Yep. The quickest we managed to do that is I came into the studio and I pitched a cricket game to our, one of our devs and we had it in the store uh, five weeks later. So that was about wow. as, as fast as we could turn ideas around. Uh, they all sucked, they all failed <laughs> in very many different ways. But it, it got people into a different sort of mindset about how we, how yeah. we can get decisions made quickly and, and, uh, and just to prove that we can create an engaging product. The, um, the next thing I needed, I, I sort of realized, we were around about, say, six to eight people at that stage. And we had sort of service work coming in that was sort of paying the bills. But I thought, okay, to make the leap to that, that next level, to, take, to win those bigger clients, uh, I need to sort of take a step back from the day-to-day -day running of things and I need to hire someone to, to look after that part of the business. And to do that, I needed to, I knew who I wanted to hire. Uh, his name is Dan Thorsen. I worked with him, he worked mm -hmm. at Ratbag, I worked with him at Chrome. Mm -hmm. To afford him, I needed to get more work. To get, to get myself to go out and find that work, I actually just went out and hired four new developers so that I had to find work for them because I knew yep. if I couldn't pay them, then the whole company was going to fail. So then that yep. forced me to go out and find the work to be able to pay for the people to be able to hire Dan. So mm -hmm. I just put all my eggs in that basket, we'll push all those chips in and, and uh, just force myself to make a change. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, so, um, so how, do you, how do you find uh, new recruits for things like that? Because like, the educational scene in Adelaide, or scene, educational services for uh, software development and games and things like that, it isn't, it isn't huge, but it's decent, you know, it's pretty good. There are a solid amount of people that come through there. Again, a lot of them find themselves moving to places like Melbourne or things like that, but how does Mighty Kingdom go about finding these new talent in that case? There's actually a lot of people around who were working in the games industry that are now either underemployed or, or who are, have been employed in other industries. So for the first thing we do is we look at um, that as a talent pool as, yep. and see if we can sort of re-engage those people back into the games industry. We also have a very strong connection to all the main training institutes, universities, AIE um, and places like that. and we. We keep an eye on the graduates from there and uh, we'll pick the best to come and do work experience with us. Mm -hmm. And from there we often, I think every single person who's ever done work experience with us has ended up being a, a hire. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we have a very strong process around how we bring juniors into the organisation and train them up very quickly to be very effective. Mm -hmm. um, we try and operate in a structure where people are given a lot of autonomy and control in, in their roles. Uh, so that means that people who show leadership or show expertise can move very quickly within the organization. There's no sort of junior, mid-senior sort of barriers. Yep. Um, people have stepped up very, very quickly. Like uh, the big project, which I can't, I can't announce, um, we, we flew three people over to, to uh, Europe to kick off that project. And one of them was uh, started with us as a junior who had been through work experience at uh, Six Foot Kid. And within three years, he's now leading a, a multi I won't say the budget, but a very large project <laughs> that we have um, for, the, for this client. So, you know, we don't, I don't tend to look at people and worry too much about their, their skills and expertise because I know that we can make someone a better programmer. I know once they're in our system, you know, what the, our, our artists are very good at training other artists and, and, and so forth. So I look for people who have the right attitude, the right uh, approach to work, the right way of working within an organisation and understanding um, what their value is and how they can sort of maximise that. And so it takes a very particular type of person, but when you find them, we find that they thrive really, really well. And I've, I've had no trouble finding those people in Adelaide. I think we train out a lot of really, really talented people. And my issue is I can't employ all of them, right? I want to try and get as many as we can. Yeah. So we do, we do bring people in, uh, you know, from interstate or people who have expertise that we don't, we can't find within within Adelaide, but very rarely we find that we can grow that talent very, very effectively. Oh, that's excellent. Well, that's completely different to um, the way that the job outlook is right now for, for pretty much most uh, industries. You know how people or places advertise for new positions and things and they need like two or three years experience and then all these other sets, sets of skills and stuff like that. But then you're mentioning here how you know you help foster sort of uh, entry level positions and then help them grow. And as you say, you train them up to fill these roles that you need and things. So it's, it's a very encouraging way of going about <laughs> it, I think. I think a lot of times as well, if you put a barrier on a, on a job application, if you say you need to have such, such experience or, or whatever, there are two types of reactions to that. Some people can be like, okay, that's not me, I can't do that. Yeah. Other people will be like, I wonder if I can get away with, you know, like, yeah. so there's a, how you approach it. I think a lot of those things are just designed to weed out a lot of tire kickers. And, and we do get a lot of, the games industry attracts a lot of people who like it because they think you get to sit around and play games all day. Right. And so 
we've got to make sure we get past those people into the people who are actually really yep. um, motivated to do to do something really exciting. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm never too concerned about uh, degrees and things like that. I don't. I don't have a degree. I, I okay. dropped out of uni after one year, so I can't turn around and say to somebody, "You have to have a degree to work here." Yeah, when I don't have right. one myself. So I just look at the individual. I look at what motivates them. What sort of what, what excites them, whether there's something that we can provide to them that allow them to grow. Sure. And you know, not everyone is always aligned. Like, well, the way we work and, and the things we work on, not everyone's into that, and mm. that's fine. Like, but the people who do take up that, you know, take that responsibility and take that control, they can, they can do great things. Excellent. Right. Still talking about Adelaide-based development and, and you know, pulling people together and things. So there, there's word in the wind about this, this new little development space uh, that's... that's uh, being created or at least uh, is in collaboration with, with Mighty Kingdom. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just just anything about Yeah, sure. About so uh, I did a talk at GCAP last year when I um, spoke about the future of the games industry in Australia, in Australia. And one of the things I believe is that if you don't have a clear vision for what you're building, you just kind of stumble forward. And, and, and what I can see is that people end up making the same mistakes that have led us down the previous path where yep. the publishers came in, we got very large, the publishers left, and then we got very small. Mm -hmm. So... One of the things I think we didn't do very well previously was collaboration within the industry. Like we are, entertainment isn't a zero-sum game, right? Like it's not like someone plays Angry Birds and then it's like, that's it, that's all the entertainment I need, and then yeah, they stop and they right. never play anything else. There's, there's always this constant demand for new stuff, and so it's a weird industry where everyone can win. Where I can have success today, you can have success tomorrow, and they're not, you know, they're, they're um, you know, what I say, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Yep. My success doesn't lead to your failure. Yep. So with that, with that mindset in place, I don't see there's any reason why we, sh we, we shouldn't collaborate more, we shouldn't share more knowledge. One of the things is I always feel about as well is it's like, how many barriers to success can I remove to help another you know, entity come up and, and, and another games company succeed? Because their success will lead to my success because that's just how the whole ecosystem works. So a big part of that was collaborative workspaces. Mm -hmm. At the end of that talk, uh, someone stood up and basically offered to put a million dollars into a co-working space in Adelaide, which was a pretty... That's nothing to scoff at. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, pretty, it was pretty exciting. It wasn't what I was expecting, so I was a tad unprepared. Yeah. I was expecting to justify it a lot more rather than have people jump straight onto it. Uh, but through a lot of conversations after that, um, so that was Game Plus, the organisation who reached out. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked with them. They've built a game uh, collaboration workspace in Canberra, and they're looking to, to build them around the country. Okay. And so we convinced them that Adelaide would be the best spot to do that next. And uh, they're 100% behind it. They've, we, they've committed to opening one this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been in discussions with them about picking exactly where that will be. Uh, the meeting I had just before I came here was with City Council. They're, they're very on board with, uh, with this initiative as well, and they want to find um, a way that they can help and... Uh, take a broader approach rather than just the game industry, but look at that sort of screen content industry um, through a wider lens and sort of build a, a sort of centre for excellence, I guess, within Adelaide where we can all sort of collaborate and, and uh, succeed together. So there's a few, that means there's a lot of moving parts about where it will be, um, what it will cost and, and, and things like that. So there's a few more conversations that need to happen uh, before we can sort of announce exactly what it's going to look like. Yep. But there will be a collaborative space. It will be in the CBD. And it will be this year. There we go. I'll put that. That's fantastic. So, <laughs> is there like a, a limit to how many people can be part of this type of thing, or like, are there is there already interest by people who want to be part of this too? I, I would say that the success of this place would, would be if we can get say 100, 120 people in one in one space. Now, Mighty Kingdom, we're getting quite large. We'll probably be about 50 by the end of the year, mm -hmm. and we're we're pretty aggressive in our in our growth plans. Um, but we want to we've designed it, our company in a way that we can always have a presence within this uh, sort of co-working. Uh, space yep. um, you know we sort of break internally down into smaller teams or studios um, so we'll always have a presence within that space because yep. um, I, I believe like one of the one of the responsibilities we have as one of the large organizations is to, to feed the, the, the companies below us and help them grow up to be as big as us or bigger than us you know like, absolutely I would love to see someone yeah create a billion dollar company right here in, in Adelaide and if we can help create an environment where that can that can occur then I'm all for it. Yeah, it's it's so interesting with games. I just listened to you talk about this, and it's it's so interesting with games development in Australia, at least. Maybe it's a bit different in the states. I mean, 
business running in America is very different to how it's run in Australia. In America, it seems very aggressive in that it's like a kill or be killed type thing. You know, we've got to be bigger than the other company and we've got to absorb them, blah, blah, blah. In Australia, it seems very different. Um, the games development scene in Australia was quite big throughout the mm. early 2000s or the, the 2000s um, uh, therein. And then um, it all of a sudden was just cut off, completely yeah. died. And then it, from the ashes, it started to slowly build up again. And from that, people are sort of, like you say, they're looking for more collaboration between all sorts of different things, people moving about between different companies a lot more and things like that. So it's really interesting. And I guess it's, it's almost exciting. It's a shame that it had to, had to die. And yeah. Many people had to lose their jobs for it to, to sort of grow like this way. So, yeah, so is there anything that you have to add to that? I mean, like you, you worked for, for some of these yeah, companies so I was, beforehand. I was right there. I was with Chrome uh, right until the end almost. I, 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 jumped, I left just before they um, sort of shut down the Adelaide studio. It was an interesting time, and I, I think that a lot of people were burnt by that. A lot of people have a lot of negative sort of memories about what that what that was like, and so I think yeah. what that's resulted in is like a reluctance to follow that sort of big studio publisher model, yeah. um, which I think is a bit of a missed opportunity. One of the one of the concerns I really have about the industry in Australia is if you reach a point in your career when you want to work on that sort of AAA you know, console product. Mm -hmm. there's, there's not really anyone in Australia that can offer you that. So you have to leave, you have to go overseas to do yeah. that. And so I think for us from Mighty Kingdom, we, we definitely have a very aggressive growth plan. We want to sort of help, if no one else is going to step up and fill that niche, we're going to sort of push ourselves in there and, and make sure, that happen. Yeah. And, uh, and you're right, I, I mean, there wasn't a lot of investment in original IP done in, in when the publishers were here. And so when they left, there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't anything to fall back on as sort of like that bread and butter. It's something we're very, very conscious of, and it's something internally we talk about a lot about building up that original IP. Uh, and I, I'd like to, you know, within these collaborative spaces as well, we would like to create an environment where someone who does have an original idea can have can sort of have all the tools at their disposal to maximise the opportunity that they mm -hmm. create with that. Um, you know, with the work we're doing, we're partnering with toy manufacturers. You know, with with here in Adelaide, we have Rising Sun, who's like a, a fantastic visual effects um, house, yeah. and have a lot of relationships back to film studios and things like that. So there's a lot of really clever and amazing things being done in Adelaide. And so we can sort of put them all together. I think we can do something something really rad. But yeah, so, and, and I think in terms of the, the industry itself, you know, at, at the time everyone was making the best decisions that they could. Right? So I, I look back on that time fondly because it was crazy. It was like, it was, I learned so much in a very, very short period of time. And a lot of the things that I do now at Mighty Kingdom are informed by what happened at Ratbag and Chrome and, you know, and other studios around. That means that you know, when we do talk to these larger publishers about bringing them back and, and trying to entice them back to Australia, for me it's about doing that on our terms and doing that with understanding that you know, a publisher is beholden to itself and when, when times get tough they will leave. So our job as an industry is to try and take as much value out of that as we can mm -hmm. and pour it back into our own industry. Like if you look at uh, you know, Defiant, they've, they're formed from sort of ex-pandemic guys, you know. Yep. So uh, out of these big studios, other companies form, and they've gone on to form the second wave of, of, uh, of Australian gaming. But then for me, it's like, okay, we need to level up to that next stage. We need to keep providing opportunities for people to move up in the, in the industry. Mm. Yeah, well, so can you talk a little bit about what it was like back then? I mean, it's completely different to what it was like today. I mean, back then we had, you know, so many, it was also, the games, uh, games themselves were also very different. We had a lot more sort of, um, mid-tier and mid -tier, licensed yeah. games and things happening in Australia than sort of big AAA ones. But, you know, even so, you know, it's vastly different to what it was like today. So what was it like back then, being in the midst of all of that? So my, so my personal journey, I came from a very large, well-oiled, efficient IT company in, in New Zealand that was running with, you know, seven or 800 employees. It was just like this big, like, machine that just kept churning on yep. and making money. And then I came to Ratbag and I thought, wow, this is crazy. Everyone just kind of like swans around and does what they want. And it, it felt very loose and very uh, sort of uh, didn't have all the sort of rigid structure that yeah. I was used to. But Ratbag was also a little bit different because they focused more on racing games, didn't they? They did. And like my time at Ratbag was very limited. I was there for about three months before they shut down. So I came in, I think in my first week I was doing 14 hour days, 16 hour days. Like it, was, it was intense, right? <laughs> like you just walked straight into yeah. like an incredibly intense period of time for the company. And when it, when it shut down, which is like two weeks before Christmas, yeah. the, uh, all my stuff hadn't arrived from New Zealand. It was still on the boat. So I, I had literally nowhere to go. Yeah. And uh, I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor. My coffee table was a microwave box. <laughs> like it, was, it was all pretty crazy. But uh, yeah, so credit to Chrome. They saw an opportunity there. 
to create a studio in Adelaide and, and they didn't have any external studios at that stage. So they, they stepped up and I moved there as a junior initially and then quickly to being a sort of a senior programmer. And uh, we grew that studio from about 15 people at the start to about 50 at, a, at, its, at its max. And then it sort of like fluctuated a bit and then eventually, eventually closed down. Um, I mean, I can't really talk about other organizations. I can just look at it through the window yep. of Chrome. I think, you know, looking, like I say, the, the, the directors of Chrome were making the best decisions they knew how to make for the company and the situation that yep. they were in. So it's hard to criticize uh, any of those decisions that were made at the time. But I think in hindsight, you can look back and say, there was a few missed opportunities. And I think when the app store, when it started to become a thing and people started to realize it was an opportunity, we certainly talked about it a lot at Chrome, but this is a company that had focused on console gaming. And so they saw that as being a bit of a step back. Yeah. And so they kind of didn't realize the opportunity of it until, until far too late. The, um, the investment in original IP, they, once the contract started to dry up, once the GFC started to sort of really hit home, they realized they needed to invest in original IP, but it came a little bit too late to be able to really you know, become a sort of solid foundation within the company. And yeah, and, and I think as well, the, the way the mid-tier just collapsed, right? Like yeah. the, the Wii came out, and there was a really huge, strong channel here yeah. that you could sort of develop, <laughs> develop title for. And we made, we made so much stuff. We made a lot of really cool things. We made Star Wars games. We made, yeah. you know, um, we started on Happy Feet. We did a whole bunch of really cool stuff. But you guys then, also did the, the, the Wii version of um, uh, Force Unleashed, right? Yeah, so we, yeah, yeah. we did, so at, in Adelaide, we did the PSP version. Oh, that's right. Yes, was, that's right. Yeah, so it was, it was kind of, this is one of those weird situations where each, each SKU, each version of the game had to be differentiated from the previous one. Yep. And what they ended up me meaning is that as we stepped down from PS3 to PS2 to PSP, we added more content. Okay. So the PSP actually had the most content okay. out of any of the games, which was kind of like an inversion of what you think it should be. That's really interesting. And uh, so I worked on the multiplayer component of that. So I had, oh, okay. I had four PSP dev kits on my desk, like jumping on one and making sure that they all jumped on the other ones. I didn't even realize that I know. had a multiplayer component. Was it, just, <laughs> so there you was, go. was it just the PSP version that had multiplayer? Well, that's the one I worked on, so that's all I know. Okay, but wow, yeah. I didn't even know that. Was but you could pick up things and throw them at each other. It was like a distributed physics simulation. Cool. I worked on that for ages. It was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's a feather in that case. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool. And uh, yeah, probably like three people in the world played it, right? So, oh, yeah. But no, it was really good. It was a really good product, and it, it reviewed really well. And we had a lot of fun on it. It was really challenging in a lot of ways. You know, it's one of those things where someone walks in and says, you guys are working on a Star Wars game. You know, you'll jump around and high five. Yeah, but the actual process of that can be quite challenging. Like, obviously, it's a brand that's very tightly controlled. So there's a lot of things you can and can't do. So, you know, I often say to the programmers at work, we're working at the moment on, on kids games, right? And I say to them, look, I've worked on Star Wars games, you know, and I've worked on, on, this, on these kids titles. Fundamentally, you're doing the same thing. You're solving problems, right? So it might not be exactly the sort of game you play at the end of it. But the process and, and the problems that you solve and the way that you do it is 100% is transferable. The core principles of making a game exactly, carry yeah. over everywhere, so yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Obviously, you, know, you have to have a strong focus on your audience, on your market, and that sort of stuff. And um, that's, you know, where a lot of people come into games thinking, I'm going to make the game I want to play. Sorry, microphone. <laughs> but uh, you know, they come and say, I want to make the games I want to play. And quite often, it's, you need to make the games that players want to play. Yep. And that will allow you to then get the skills to build the games that you want to play. So yeah. it's, there's, there's a journey there that you have to go on. That's fantastic. So, um, yeah, so uh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Oh, yeah, so Chrome. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah I can talk yeah, about I, Yeah, so I think like it was quite a sad thing when, when the studio started to shut down, obviously. Like, mm -hmm. there's, like you say, a lot of very talented people. Were, were laid off and they, a lot of the majority of them left to go overseas. The very talented ones got scooped up pretty quickly. And a lot of us were sort of left without much to do. And it has been a constant frustration of mine that when I moved to Adelaide, so I'm, I'm from, from New Zealand originally, when I moved to Adelaide, I had a lot of opportunity in front of me. I had a lot of places I could work and, and a whole thriving industry that I could sort of participate in. Yep. And that is not exactly the case right now. And so I'm sort of has driven me to want to recreate that so that the people coming into industry now have the same opportunities that I had and hopefully, you know, even more. So mm. it's one of my, it's one of the things that drives me every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. So what other games did um, Chrome make though? Because um, like well, I Chrome, say, Chrome itself was a huge company. I think it was, you know, 450 to 500 people at its max. That's, a, that's but a massive. But it focused mostly on console games, right? It did, so yes. what, So, and you said that you were talking a little bit about mobile development there. So why didn't Chrome just make that leap to mobile development? 
I think it's fundamentally different to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we can look at mobile development today and we can say, okay, there's Unity and there's all these tools and you can sort of, the path to market's very clear and, and, it, and it's very obvious. But in the early days, it was a, it was a bit of a crapshoot, right? No one knew what was going to stick and what wasn't. Yep. And you can point at things like uh, Fruit Ninja and say, look, just do, do this, right? Mm -hmm. But like Fruit Ninja is one of those once in a lifetime sort of you know, opportunities. And it, it's, like I say, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You can look at that and say, yeah. of course it was the next big thing. Yeah, yeah, but course. like, you know, we're in that stage right now with VR and AR. Is that going to be the next big thing? Who can 100% mm -hmm. say that it is, right? Yeah. I think ultimately, though, you need to go, if you're an entertainment company, you need to go where the audience is. And there were a few people who very quickly saw that smartphones were just exploding. And mm -hmm. so they realized that that's where the audience was going to go and that's where they needed to be. But really, that's only a handful of companies, right? Yeah. And yep. they've become quite big, and they've all been absorbed by sort of larger publishers. You know, they've sort of now that the that the market is mature, you're starting to see it consolidate. You're starting to see the big players come in. But at the time, it was like it was just the new shiny thing. And there's yeah, always a new right. shiny thing. Right? That's right. Yeah, trend. Yeah. Yeah. So well, so do you see uh, any hot <laughs> scoops that you can drop here? Do you see Mighty Kingdom ever returning, uh, t taking uh, your history and sort of returning to um, consoles or even opening up to something new like VR? Yeah, so I mean, I never say never. Right? <laughs> you, you never want to be the guy who says like, "No, nah, that'll never oh, be that's a thing." Right. Yeah. So, uh, like, uh, I can go on the record and saying maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair no I, I think like as we grow as a company, like we've got pretty aggressive growth targets. So, like I said, we'll probably be about fifty people by the end of this year. We want to be hundred next year, two hundred the year after. Like, we want to get quite large. Mm -hmm. And the reasoning behind that is there are certain opportunities that only present themselves at a certain scale. So no one's going to park a $20 million project on a four-man team, right? Yep. So you're going to, you're going to have to show uh, an ability to work at a certain scale to be able to attract projects of a certain scale. And so that's, that's part of the reason behind it. The other reason is we do need to diversify. We need to show, we've shown incredible expertise within a particular demographic on a particular platform. I'd love to be able to take that onto another platform or, or an adjacent demographic and start to grow it that way and show that we have a broad range of skills, I mean, which we do. Like, there's, there's, like you say, there's not much different between coding a like a, a racing game and like coding a, an iPhone game like there, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of crossover in the in the process but we need to show expertise and leadership in that before we get projects that's uh, you know in that sort of in that genre or that demographic so that's that's our next growth growth plan is to build our original product leverage the audience that we have um, and try and grow into new platforms and to, into new demographics mm. so that we can eventually start to flex out until we are, we do cover that, you know, the whole, the whole gamut. Um, yeah, so we will get back to console. Mm -hmm. There's a huge audience there and they love content, so it'll be, it'll be a shame not to get there, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like I say, it's wherever the audience is. And as long as they're still buying consoles, we'll look at making games. Tonight. Excellent. Well, so what about the current climate of um, Australian game development? I mean, we've talked about the past. What is it, what's it kind of like now? What does it look like now? And then moving into the future as well. Like, do we see Australia's uh, game development scene returning to being quite large and having many like, larger studios taking on bigger projects, making something like LA Noir again? You know? Do we see something like that happening, whether it's in Adelaide or Melbourne or back in Sydney again, or even Perth or something like that? Do you, like, what, what are your opinions on that? Well, uh, yeah, I think the industry has become comfortable at a certain scale. We're seeing a lot of studios around 20, maybe 25 people and people are sort of stopping at that point. What will happen in any mature market is that there will be consolidation and you'll start to see big players come in. We're seeing a little bit of that with Gree coming into Melbourne and starting to sort of aggressively hire up. You'll, you'll start to see publishers looking at what's happening in Australia and being like, okay, let's acquire that talent and have them making product for us. And so you, they'll start to roll up and there'll, there'll be some bigger companies that form out of that. And whether or not the big publishers come back I don't think they're just going to rock up and set up shop. They're going to have yeah. to be enticed back. Yep. And I think that's a combination of um, federal level funding or support and, and state level. Um, you know, we, we're constantly in conversations with state government and, and anyone who listens to us basically about creating those conditions that will bring, bring those players back. I think they will. The, there'll be a point where the opportunity is too great for them to ignore. Um, and like I say, it's all about us understanding what the risks are in that, in that and what the opportunities are and how we can use that to sort of build a more, more robust industry. So if I, I look around now, and I think there's, there probably still are a lot of people working in the games industry, but instead of being siloed into some big, big shops, they're kind of distributed a lot more. And it's a lot quieter now as well. It's not as like big and bombastic as it was before. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Perhaps, yeah. I think like the, the hits get a lot of attention. That's uh, true, yeah. Um, you know, that we see 
uh, Crossy Road, you know, those guys have done some fantastic things. Mm -hmm. And we, like the... Half break. Yeah, I mean, half break, yeah, the, the elephant in the, in the room. They've, they've done them, like, not many people can say they shipped a billion units of anything, that's right? right? Yeah, so, like, that's, that's, that's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing story. Um, and, yeah, so I think, you know, you're seeing now even, like, Pretty Great, which has come out of, um, out of Half Brick and have started their own thing. You're starting to see other studios sort of, the success of Half Brick is there to the success of more, you know, smaller studios. And that's, that's what I mean by I would love to see that big tentpole, huge blockbuster success because that sort of will feed another that's sort right, of yeah. level of success, you know, another layer of companies coming through. Um, but yeah, so I think the future is bright and I, I think a lot of the people who are running these studios now, they were involved in the publisher model and they understand the, the benefits of it and the negatives of it. And so we probably, fingers crossed, won't head down the same path and make the same mistakes we made before. Like we, we do have a humongous amount of original content being created now, more so than ever before. Yeah, yeah. And the industry is getting to a point where it's almost impossible to ignore it from a federal level. And you know, certainly when they look they're trying. They're trying to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I heard some interesting things today. We'll see, we'll see how it all, uh, what it all shakes out. Yeah. But sorry. Yeah, the, the best thing the industry can do is is just keep doing good stuff because eventually you get too big to ignore, right? And that's right. Yeah. It it takes a lot of the boxes in terms of innovation, in terms of um, you know, so sort of forward looking markets and the the amount of the amount of people who have mobile phones or who have ability to to access games now is like ridiculous, right? Yeah. It's like a ridiculous level. And there's a huge constant demand for content, and it takes people to generate that content. It's like it's like a, this is a, this whole engine that needs to be running mm. to just keep you know feeding this this uh, this industry. So the opportunity is there, and there's no reason you can't do that from Australia, right? Like particularly as the NBN starts to creep a bit further around into people's you know businesses and homes, you, the ability to publish stuff and have it you know appear anywhere in the world is like becoming easier and easier. Mm. So it's all it's all very exciting. I think the future is positive. Uh, and like I say, the, the publishers will be back. They'll be back when it makes sense for them to do so, when they can make money doing it. Mm -hmm. And if we keep winning, then they'll be here sooner rather than later. Yeah. Well, there aren't many industries that can, you know, grow, die, and then grow again in such a short amount of time. Yeah. You know, like the music industry, you know, hasn't really been flourishing all that much lately. The film industry, the same thing, although a little bit more with some of the streaming services. But like the games industry, like it keeps coming back. It's still there. It's yeah. It's, People always want to be entertained, man. They always want to play games. There's That's always right, yeah. a market for it. There's, there's never going to be a point in time where people are like, I'm not going to play a game. You know, like there's not going to be a point in time where people don't play games. It's always going to be there. Hmm. So yeah, that's one of the reasons why I find the industry so fascinating, right? Because it is very fluid and it does change and you have to be nimble and you, you can't sort of be rigid in your thinking at any one point because like you say, VR could be this big thing. Mm -hmm. It could be hundreds of millions of people playing VR, in which case, you know, who's going to be providing that content? You want it to be there at the forefront and yeah, it's, it's, it's very exciting. It's an exciting time. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. And no, coming no in. problem. I think we'll finish up there. So yeah, thank you for joining us, Phil. No worries, thank you. Yeah, all the best. Cheers.